Welcome back. We're looking at Colonel Sladen's account, his travels in Myanmar, formerly Burma, in 1868. And these are just some of the highlights that I took. I read the whole thing, not every last word, but I skimmed a lot of it. So here he's talking about this building that we talked about in the previous video, the pagoda, the unfinished stupa, they call it, at Mingan, which he refers to as uh, Mangun, Mangun. Just what they say in Wikipedia and then all the travel guides, everybody, the people who visit it, the people, if you would go there today and you walk around, there would be somebody who would speak English and they would say exactly what is on the sign, that this was intended to be a gigantic pagoda that's only not even halfway finished. It was left unfinished in consequence of the prediction that its completion would be fatal to the royal founder. And then in 1839, an uh, earthquake split the large, the huge cube of solid brickwork, and now it is a fantastic ruin. At the time, it was just a few miles from the capital. And so he visited the huge ruin of solid brickwork. So somehow they knew it was solid back then. So he was told the same story when he went because it was after the earthquake of 1839, not, to eight, not, not 1836, 1839. So the encircling terraces, yeah, they were brick as well. And um, he talks about the bell and the, the weight of the bell and all the same stuff that they tell you today. And um, the other pagoda, there's another one nearby that was interesting because it, even though it's probably very modern, it depicts the mythical Mayan Mu Dung or Maru Mountain or Mount Maru, the central pillar of the universe and the seven encircling ranges of mountains or the six continents, each of which is guarded by a monster, the first by the dragon, the second by the bird, Kalan. It might be also suggested that those terraces may represent the six happy abodes of gnats, not gnats, just N-A-T-S, gnats, which are like demons, which form successive Elysiums below the seat of Brahma, or angels. It's, it's weird. So they have this belief over there, especially at the time, about angels, demons, just in their everyday life. So when he was there, he talks about something that may not still be visible, but uh, in the middle distance of right where he was, near that big brick building in, what year, 18, when he was there in the 1860s, like during the Civil War times in America, he saw the golden roofs of the city gates and many monasteries clustered outside red city walls that reflected back the sunbeams and the roof, the roofs had spires. So yeah, it was picturesque. He said it was, things were gilded. The temples were gilded. So I don't know how much of that um, survived because he's talking about it being the abandoned capital. So it seems like it hadn't been abandoned for long. And, um, a dense forest of magnificent timber and thousands of seedling trees surrounds and covers the sites and ruins of the ancient cities. Interesting that there are seedling trees, like as if they're planting trees to kind of cover it up, of which nothing now remains but low lines and shapeless masses of brickwork. So even back then, they seem to have been depopulated. It's kind of a post-reset. And this is a repeating theme as I read this, that many of the cities he encountered, they were almost uninhabited. And there was always some reason that, oh, well, all the males had left to go fight and, and a few of the females remain. Or, oh, this village was slaughtered by this other village and they, they left almost nobody. Or everybody in this area was moved out from a fear of a flood or... Everyone was moved out of here because of a disease or they all had died of some fever. And it's just, it's kind of shocking because it's so depopulated. 
Occupying the angle between the two rivers, the remains of an ancient city are still discernible. Though completely overgrown by magnificent trees and thickets of bamboo and elephant grass, the broad wall composed of bricks and pebbles can be traced from the river banks at its northern and southern extremities, which are a mile apart. We followed one section for three quarters of a mile and found it in some places 30 feet high from the bottom of the moat, which is still traceable. So again, more bricks. So these are ruins all over the place. And you would think, you know, why would they be in ruins? Like here he says further down, there's yet another ruined city of the same name on the other side of the river. But then that one didn't present as much antiquity. So like two ages of ruins just near this capital. Here too is that old brick building um, mentioned as probably the remains of an old English factory erected in the beginning of the 17th century. See, they, they didn't even know. These are the English. And the English revisit a colony. I didn't even know they were over there that long prior. And I'm not sure if it's a colony or when it was ever that, but the English are visiting it and they some factory, but they're not even sure if it was theirs, but it was built out of bricks. We have little but conjecture to guide us as to the vicissitudes of these ancient cities of the Shan kingdom of Pong. So, yeah, it's, it's just interesting that a, a traveler historian guy doesn't know in another country of the major building in, in there in ruins was built a century ago by somebody from his own country. I just, it's just a very questionable. Yeah, here he talks about the people doing kind of like witchcraft, chanting, channeling spirits. And he had to sit through that and watch that and seemed to be a money grab, but it's just a matter of time before the person doing the performance gets exhausted and takes whatever the money they offered was. <laughs> he kept kicking it away. It's just weird. And then he talks about petrified wood, a whole area of it. And there's a mine, the silver mines. So there's a lot of petrified wood. And it just seems like they're just groups of people around the mines kind of looking in, seeing what they could get, but that nobody really knew who built it, when it was built, what they really got out of it. They assume it's a silver mine, but they don't really know. That He describes the dimensions of the mine. It's near a river. His guides are going through probably for the first time themselves. Uh, the earth he mentions is red. There are these red masses of earth which I think may be crumbled, really ancient bricks. The red earth mixed with masses of marble and quartzite. Um, but the passages are blocked because the, the mines have the roofs fallen in. The bamboo props used when they were working the mine had given way. No detailed information regarding the productiveness of these mines could be obtained. And as far as they knew, since their memory and the outbreak of the Civil War, they had, these mines really hadn't been worked, just only a very small and intermittent extent. But there was evidence of heaps of slag and smelting operations that were conducted. So whatever the ore was, they were processing it. And they did some scientific measurements to find out, yes, there was some silver in it. Silver and gold. Silver and gold. He talks about these villages, their settlements, they are scattered 800 to 1,000 houses with a population of four to 5,000. Um, but uh, a lot fewer people live in there. And supposedly in 1863, the bad guys stormed the town, ruined the defenses, and destroyed the buildings. And the only people left are dejected, poverty-stricken inhabitants who have partially repaired some of the brick built dwellings but for the most part they lived in these wooden shacks kind of almost outside of town it sounds so familiar 
to some of the so many of the pictures of what we would consider possibly post reset times. Four hundred yards from the northeast gate was the bazaar, a village in itself. So there were two lines of houses. So they just lived in like row housing and just had this little village where they try to sell whatever, <laughs> whatever they scrape up around the area. They came across a guy who had been assaulted by bandits and was dying and he was robbed and they couldn't do anything for him and he died. So it was a rough environment. They had a few scrapes themselves in I'm not going to cover it here, but a lot they were a lot of people just try to get money from them, threaten them, steal from them all throughout the trip. So they they had to have weapons and they had to be shrewd in dealing with the local warlords and things like that. It's kind of semi-civilized. It, it wasn't totally like warlord feudalism or anything like chaotic, but the rule of law was a little bit stretched. So he comes across another wretched walled village in ruins garrisoned by a few soldiers. Crumbling walls and ruins overgrown with weeds and jungle. It was hard to believe that this place had been held by an enemy and stormed only weeks before. <laughs> it's interesting. They talk about streams that were um, fed by springs. And the springs issue forth from near a lot of these ruins. And I think that's the remnants of some of these ancient structures, these boiling springs. Um, there's a lot of quartz. The materials kind of change in the area. And they talk about the possibility of an old volcanic vent and things like that, which is possible. But what that is, we don't really know exactly. They have jets of, of steam and, and springs of boiling water. And uh, the water comes up through circular apertures about three inches in diameter. Um, owing to the heat and the volume of steam, it was only accessible on the, the leeward side. And the ground was so hot that our barefooted followers could not approach by some yards. It vibrated in a remarkable way. And the sensation was as if one were standing over a gigantic boiler buried in the earth, which was increased by the loud roar of the steam from the funnels and the indistinct rumbling, rumbling noises in the hidden inferno. Well, what could it be? Well, what if it's a gigantic boiler buried in the earth? It's like uh, Jack Burton and... Big trouble in Little China. What's that? Oil? No, it's not oil. It's the black blood of the earth. Well, it looks like oil. It's the black blood of the earth. Well, it feels like we're standing over a, gig a gigantic boiler buried in the earth. The loud roar, the steam, the rumbling, indistinct rumbling noises, a hidden inferno. Well, maybe you were. <laughs> it is remarkable that although the steam is at scalding heat, the stones in it are covered with masses of green jelly. Well, anyway, we were informed that the springs are much resorted to by patients from all parts who use the springs to cook their food and cure themselves in the vapor. See, there were always these healing properties. I think there's some kind of enchantment, whether you want to call it magic, science, or whatever, that maybe we don't understand, but from these ruined probably antediluvian structures that had waterworks that still functions, whether or not it was already there in nature randomly and buildings were erected around these phenomena to take advantage for district heating, things like that. Or if part of the building process was to have these waterworks and in the design, did they have something that they could do to make it curative, perhaps the combination of minerals, whatever the case, the location, whatever it is. We don't know maybe the energies, what's involved. We don't know. But time and time again, all over the face of the earth, in these types of places where they have these truly ancient ruins and they have these springs and hot boiling, hot water coming out, almost like pipes, 
in what's left of these structures, they often have curative powers and they're valued and sought after. And the people who go there feel better. And he says he enjoyed the halt. So um, they all just start feeling better. It's like in Tron when they're drinking the water, <laughs> the special glowing water, or it's like the Lembus bread in Lord of the Rings, something like that. I don't know. It's very interesting to me. And again, he, he comes across another city 20 years after some kind of supposed incursion. The city remains like a city of the dead, extensive walls surrounding acres of ruins with a few wild hillmen dwelling in them. It's just like what we saw in Italy and everywhere else when these you know, post-reset accounts are put to print just before, or even this is during the age of photography, but what you see are the same thing. It's just ruins. There's a few people living around there. And even centuries before, it was the same story. So he talks about a road with deep track of ruts over jagged stones leading over high mountains into deep valleys. It's kind of like the Oregon Trail, maybe, but I don't know. It's pretty dubious. It's, and then it said, it's melancholy to see these fine valleys given up to rank grass and the ruined villages that are plainly distinguishable in the fields laying in silent attestation of former prosperity. Every day I come to what was a busy city, but now only containing a few new houses inside walls which surround a wide space of ruins. But the people are returning gradually, and the blue smoke can be seen curling up here and there against the background of the pine-clad hills. It must take some few years to repopulate the country, rich as it is. So there's some kind of terrible things that happened, but we don't know. We just don't know. And then here he talks about a legend commonly current regarding the more ancient pagodas of Burma. Um, but he doesn't get into his long talk about the archaeology. There is something in the foreword where he mentions there's a lot more to say about it, but he wasn't really approved to talk about it or it wasn't all within the scope of his travel log. So then he said if he would get permission or get um, blessing or whatever to, to share the rest of it, that he would, but I don't think he ever did. But some of that may have been whatever he learned here that we may never know. But he was talking to some of the elders that uh, said things were a little different than what you're being told and so he, it, because it contradicted, he, he couldn't present it, but it's probably the actual truth or something closer to it. But he said he learned there existed ancient histories of the district in some of the areas. And he was shown a, a photograph of the a pagoda Rangoon, and they expressed their regret that during the municipal improvements of the town, the sites of the sacred buildings had been become the junction of crossroads, which seemed in their minds, a desecration. They were, however, relieved by the assurance that this must have been done by the British authorities in ignorance of the religious prejudice, prejudices affected. I don't know. Did they care at the time? Probably not as much. But again, yes, this building, here's the eye of the, the, the other three eyes. Nobody knows where they are, but it's solid marble. But it's, it's an interesting shape as well. You think it was carved that way? <laughs> it's fascinating no matter what. Covered in some kind of what was thought to have been stone at the time, but it's not sandstone. It couldn't be. It's like a coating. It's not stucco, really. Nobody really knows what it is. At least I haven't seen that. And oddly enough, amongst the bricks where the heads fell off of these supposed lions... They had these teak wood timbers that I guess were like the bones that were supposed to hold it up. Really piss poor construction. Those heads were never going to stay on. It's just amazing. It's just solid masonry. And they tried to cantilever the heads out. And it must have worked for some time, but then didn't. But it's similar in a lot of ways to some of these other structures. 
And when I look at them, to me, it just looks like bricks. So sometimes the bricks are just completely replaced with other minerals, but you can tell that at one point they were stacked up bricks. And so much of the world was maybe just made of bricks, like originally. Otherwise, how would you explain some of these stone ruins? If they were originally bricks filled in with minerals from the flood and then parts of it fall off, but it holds the original shape, which would have the right angles of the bricks of the original building, which would probably have been collapsed and compressed down. But to me, that would make sense to explain what some of these things are that they find. I'm not saying they were all made of bricks, but the, the one of the top three building materials of antediluvian structures had to have been bricks. And sometimes it's not even recognizable what you see now after it's been replaced by other minerals. So we can look at those other things sometime, but uh, in Japan, some of these buildings look so similar to the one in Myanmar they're just maybe more ancient or, or more or less preserved preserved differently definitely not the original materials but the original bricks what's left of them I think the impressions what what is there in place of them with generally the same shape it would make sense that way so let me know what you think hope you enjoyed and we'll catch you next time.